In case you didn't know, here in the UK, we've recently switched monarchs following the death of Queen Elizabeth. I'm no royalist, and I don't claim to have my finger on the pulse of society, but the general sentiment I'm picking up on is that most people don't seem to care, aside from the fact that we got an extra national holiday out of it. I spent my extra day off being productive by making this stupid joke. Bruce Wayne is Batman! That's absurd. I know Bruce Wayne. If he's Batman, I'm the King of England. And people wonder why no one takes Britain seriously anymore. However, recent events got me thinking about a number of royal villains seen in Batman the Animated Series. There were three main king villains that appeared in the show. But in researching them, I found that there wasn't really enough substance to justify a video each. So you're getting a bumper coronation special video from me looking at Gotham City's villainous monarchs. Let's kick things off with the Sewer King. Taking inspiration from Oliver Twist's Fagin, the Sewer King is an original creation that debuted in the much maligned episode, The Underdwellers. I have to say that the Sewer King is the definite highlight of this otherwise pretty tedious episode. The Sewer King runs a gang of child slaves slash thieves from the sewers of Gotham. The children are kept underground during the day to provide manual labor. Just who are they growing all of those sewer mushrooms for? Do I want to know? Probably not and by night they're instructed to steal for their master. The Sewer King is a harsh taskmaster with strict rules of silence and obedience. Those who do not obey are chucked in a bright room for hours at a time or potentially fed to his pet alligators. He's by no means a physical threat to Batman and is easily defeated, but he has quite a memorable pirate-like design and his voice and vocal inflection will stick in your mind. We are the silent ones. We follow the invisible creed. But, 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 someone was talking. You, 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 you were heard. And we all know the punishment for talking. The Sewer King was briefly introduced to the main DC Comics during the year-long 52 series and was immediately killed off by Bruno Mannheim as he made his play for taking over Gotham City. Following the New 52 continuity reset, the Sewer King was reintroduced by writer Tom King in Batman Catwoman 1 as an early mentor for Selina Kyle. Note that his design and methods of disciplining his army of runaway children are very accurate to the animated series, and I approve. I would love to say that there was some deeper meaning behind this character, and that by examining him we'd get some profound understanding about the nature of the human condition, but no. No, the Sewer King is a vile human being that victimises children, and Batman really taught him a lesson. I don't pass sentence. That's for the courts. But this time, this time... I am sorely tempted to do the job myself. Next we have the Condiment King. Much like the Sewer King, the Condiment King is also an original creation for Batman the Animated Series. He briefly appeared in the episode Make Him Laugh, in which the Joker took revenge on the judges of a comedy competition that had previously snubbed him. His scheme revolved around using the Mad Hatter's mind control tech to convince them to become rubbish supervillains and ruin their lives. In Buddy Stadler's case, he became the Condiment King, the Prince of Pickles, the Sultan of Sauce, armed with his ketchup and mustard guns, plus sachets of hot sauce. The Condiment King was easily foiled, slipping on his own sauce and falling from a ledge, landing on top of Bullock and Montoya's squad car. Come back, man. Let's see if you can cut the mustard. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> you hit me. The Condiment King would find his way to the mainstream DC Universe in 2002's Birds of Prey 37. This version of the character is named Mitchell Mayo and he commits crimes entirely of his own volition, wearing a sleek black costume. This sad little man was an early foe of Robin and Batgirl and once captured he spent years under examination at Arkham Asylum where he befriended Poison Ivy. With her knowledge of plants and spices she taught him how to make deadlier sources. The Condiment King would escape Arkham and start causing trouble. It would take the combined skills of Black Canary, Robin and the Blue Beetle to take him down. He was briefly killed off prior to the New 52, but since the DC Universe continuity was reset, he has been seen getting his head kicked in while Batman ponders whatever emotional predicament he's in during Tom King's lengthy run on Batman. Again, there's no deeper meaning behind this villain, but he's unique enough to have earned the love and affection of Batman actor Robert Pattinson. So there's a bad guy in the animated series called Condiment King. 
You, you're really sticking with this. I, really, really I just think it. it's the greatest idea as a guy who just sprays mustard and ketchup at people. And I just think it's such a great idea for a bad guy. Finally, we have the Clock King. It may surprise you to learn that this character is not traditionally a Batman villain. Instead, he's a Green Arrow villain, historically clad in a green, white and blue costume complete with clock face mask. That's not the only way he differs from his animated series counterpart. William Tockman was a watchmaker who learned that he had a fatal illness and only had a few short months to live. Fearing what would happen to his sickly disabled sister after he was gone, Tockman decided to spend what little time he had left committing robberies to build a fortune to pay for his sister's care. However, after he was apprehended by Green Arrow, he learned that his doctor was mistaken. He was actually perfectly healthy. And while incarcerated, his sister was put into a state-run care home where she quickly died. Blaming his doctor and Green Arrow, Tockman vowed to take revenge once he escaped from prison. Outside of the first handful of stories, the Clock King really wasn't very prominent. He appeared as a member of the Injustice League and the Suicide Squad, but mostly as a background character. The Clock King's other notable appearance, and the most likely reason why he eventually found his way to beat us, is in the two-part episode of the 1960s Batman show. In this universe, the Clock King is the Mad Hatter's brother, and he is obsessed with stealing clocks. When it came time for the writers of BTAS to define their rogues gallery, the writers took everything that they had liked about the Clock King, a time-related tragedy that led to personal ruin, and changed pretty much everything else. I'm going to hand over to BTAS story editor Marty Pasco to explain their philosophy when it came to adapting villains. In our approach to the show, what we did is say, we are not going to be bound by any comics fan's idea of canon. We have a rich mythology here that goes back, at that point it was 60 years, and we said, why not just cherry pick from the best of it? And if some of the stuff is best in terms of conception, but might be played a little bit hokey because the comics are old, we don't need to be bound by that. So what we decided was, we'll take elements of the villains from the comics, but if they needed to have a new backstory, if we needed to uh, flesh out something that was only hinted at in the comics, we weren't bound by the comics. The BTAS version of The Clock King was renamed Temple Fugit, a play on the Latin Tempus Fugit, meaning time flies, and he was an efficiency expert whose company went bankrupt after he acted upon Hamilton Hill's advice to change up his meticulous schedule and let his hair down a little. Summary judgment against him stands at $20 million. <laughs> Thinking that Hill had intentionally sabotaged him, Fugit set about getting his revenge on Hill. Fugit's real strength is his meticulous planning ability. He's able to anticipate almost every possible outcome and plan a strategy accordingly. However, he lacks creativity. When trapping Batman in a near foolproof trap, inside a bank vault that's being drained of oxygen with a bomb inside of it, he failed to take into consideration that Batman might be able to devise a creative method of escape. While his scheme was foiled by Batman, the Clock King managed to evade capture. He returned in the episode Time Out of Joint, armed with a strange device that allowed him to slow and speed up time. With these fantastic new abilities, the Clock King could have achieved absolutely anything, but all he wanted to do was get revenge on Hill. Again, his pettiness and lust for vengeance would be his undoing, and this time he was caught and sent to prison. The Clock King's final appearance would come in Justice League Unlimited, during the episode Task Force X where we learn that he is the strategist for Amanda Waller's Task Force X, the DCAU version of the Suicide Squad. Fugit is the brains behind the mission to steal a powerful object from the Watchtower, right under the Justice League's nose. This animated version of the Clock King would go on to inspire two new versions of the character. 2008's Clock King, who had the superpower of being a few seconds ahead of everyone else, was the leader of the Terror Titans, a villainous counterpart to the Teen Titans. This version of the Clock King shares the colour scheme and watch face glasses of Temple Fugit, but also incorporates the clock face motif of the classic version of the character. Secondly, writer Tom King introduced the Temple Fugit version of the character to the DC Universe in the 2022 limited series Batman Killing Time. The story revolves around the theft of a priceless mystical artifact by Catwoman and the Riddler, but it has some really good twists and turns along the way and I really don't want to spoil it. If you get the chance to read it, I recommend that you do, especially if you're a fan of BTAS's Clock King. If it hadn't become clear yet, there's one thing that links these three villains outside of their regal names, and that's writer Tom King, the bonus fourth king of this video. 
presumably of no relation to our villainous kings, Tom King put these villains back where they belong, on a pedestal in his recent Batman comics. So here's a special salute for Tom King. I don't love all of his Batman comics, but I admire his efforts to canonise these often overlooked Batman the Animated Series villains. Now I just patiently await the day when he writes a gritty Boss Biggest miniseries. Now that was real funny. Throw in the box!